You're listening to Breakpoint This Week, where we're talking about the top stories of the week from a Christian worldview. Today, we're going to talk about the ongoing invasion in Ukraine and whether Christians should look at this as a fulfillment of prophecy about the end times and how we can talk about that responsibly. We're also going to talk about the new bill in Florida that governs sexual education curriculum for young kids. Welcome to Breakpoint This Week from the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. I'm Maria Baer alongside John Stone Street. We don't have a lot of time for your jokes this morning, Stone Street. We have a lot to talk about. So is there anything you wanted to tease me about or anything we can get that out of the way and then move into it? I, I, th- I feel like this is a <laughs> misdirected sense of guilt because you're the one that always kind of tries to lob some sort of misdirected, unexpected so line untrue. of conversation. And I'm just, it's going to be great when people can see the video of this because then they're going to know for real that I'm, I'm just sitting here with this quizzical look on my face going, what happened? I like to keep you on your toes. It's just so it's it part of the art of conversation. Yeah. I thought you were going to tease me because I told you to watch a TV show this week and you just absolutely do not trust my recommendations anymore. It's true. So I'm going to have to go the Sarah route. I'm going to have to get Sarah on board so that you watch it too. She trusts you less on recommendations. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Okay. I do want to get to it, though. We have a lot to get to today. One of the first things that we wanted to talk about was there was a piece in Rolling Stone this week about how Christians are talking about the war in Ukraine as a prophecy or a fulfillment of prophecy towards the end times. So I want to get to that piece in a minute, but just by way of update. So things are still going on as they have been in Ukraine, which is kind of incredible. Every day that passes is incredible because it's obvious that Putin thought this was going to be something quick. He was going to be able to invade Ukraine, take over several major cities, and I don't know, move on from there. We're not sure what his exact goals are, of course. But the Ukrainians have really put up a fight. And I don't think a single large city, I mean, Kiev isn't taken yet. Odessa isn't taken yet. A lot of cities are taking really hard attacks. And there's a humanitarian crisis at the borders of Ukraine where, you know, refugees are fleeing to Poland and Moldova and all nearby countries. And that's its own problem. And then other cities, I I heard a report yesterday on the Daily from the New York Times that other cities are just completely cut off from supplies. Mariupol has people reportedly that are dying from starvation or dehydration because they're not able to get to food, which is hard to wrap your brain around. But there's also been reports this week that the Russian army is now targeting civilian spots on purpose. So there was a maternity hospital that was hit this week. I think a children's hospital as well. These are the reports that are coming out. So the situation is ongoing and just continues to devolve into more barbaric stories and reports, which is it's just hard to take. I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't think anybody does at this point. But I do want to get to this Rolling Stone piece. So it's Rolling Stone. So you have to understand the tone going in is not going to be friendly toward Christianity, regardless of what the topic is. And the tone here obviously had, you know, they, they were, they're poking fun. Like, let's look at these silly Christians who talk about Christianity as having anything to do with the wider world outside of going to church on Sunday. But they they brought up, I think, Pat Robertson, Greg Laurie, and some other Christian pastors, some well-known names, have been talking about the conflict in Ukraine and whether it fits into end times prophecy. I think, again, we can note the condescending tone from Rolling Stone on its own. But I did want to talk with you about this because I think this is a normal human reaction when something terrible happens that we're trying to make sense of. We want to know how this fits into the larger story. And I want to ask you, like, is that a bad thing to do? Because I know that we want to avoid reading the tea leaves because Jesus spoke specifically about not doing that, you know, and not obsessing over what's the day or the hour, because he said, even I don't know what the day or the hour is. The important thing is to follow the will of God and to live as builders of the kingdom while we're here in the time we're given. At the same time, Again, those questions are natural. When something this horrible happens, when a maternity hospital is hit with a bomb, you start asking questions like that. And I I think part of it is we want this to feel like it has some sort of meaning. Otherwise, if it's just nonsense, that's it feels even harder to take, but also because it's scary. So how do you guide Christians to look at stuff like this? Do you think we should avoid talk of the end times altogether or how, how do we do it? 
You know, I, th there is a, a good bit of snarkiness that are leveled to anyone who tries to make connections to current day events and eschatology. And that comes from two different sides. Number one, it comes from the side of folks like Rolling Stone magazine who don't really have a faith, don't really have a commitment. And if they do have a commitment to faith, it's this kind of radically privatized faith that says that, you know, Christianity is a personal religion. It's not really something that is true about life in the world. It's something that gives us meaning and purpose and, you know, that sort of thing. In, in other words, the worldview coming in is one in which there is not a providential hand over the course of history. That That is a big difference between someone who is a secularist with a religious twist and someone who is deeply religious and thinks, for example, that history is headed in a particular direction, that something's overseeing the course of history, governing it, and that sort of thing. The other place that the kind of the cynicism and the snarkiness comes is from believers who have moved from one eschatological vision than another. I often joke that I've got really strong opinions about this, eschatology, how the end times are going to unfold, and that I paid a seminary a lot of money to get those views, although I probably <laughs> don't have the same view as some of the seminary. So, it, 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 you know, these things actually do matter. But, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's like the old joke about Calvinist, of which I am one, you know, when someone finally becomes a Calvinist, you should lock them in a room for two years until they get over themselves. Because there's this sense that I've really found it. And that's true, by the way, when someone the cage converts stage. here there. Yeah, it is the cage stage. But part of the reason for that is well-founded, and that is that those who have a particular view of the end times have been irresponsible in trying to make connections, trying to not only say that this is the view of the end times, but this is how the view of the end times is going to unfold. That's not something that the Bible covers. Uh, we quoted just recently a passage which is often pointed to in terms of signs of the end times being wars and rumors of wars. And the very next phrase is, and the end is not yet, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you also then quoted Jesus elsewhere saying, you know, I don't, I don't know the time and the place. Mm -hmm. Now, to what degree that was a statement of taking on the form of humanity, as Paul wrote in Philippians, I think was the case of kind of being a part of the human story and what that meant in the incarnation. There's a whole lot of theological ramifications that'll take us down a pretty deep rabbit hole here, I, you know? What, what exactly he meant by that, I think, is, is there's different views on. Mm. But one of the things that the Bible is clear about is that it is very difficult, yet impossible with any sort of level of certainty, to make the connections with particular views of the end times and specific events. And so, again, recently on our Q&A podcast, Shane and I have been joking about how much I hate the word balance or third way. In other words, don't go to this extreme, don't go to this extreme, because I feel like whenever you talk about balance, you're going to compromise something. But there is a lesson here for both sides, those who misbehave with eschatology and those who are snarky and cynical about eschatology. And the answer to both of them is, is we need to think about the end times as the Bible allows us to think about end times. So let me just give you two or three quick things. Number one is yeah. we often use views of the end times to scare each other. The clear teaching of scripture, and I'm thinking here of Paul and Thessalonians, is that the end times should be a source of encouragement for believers. Second, the Bible doesn't give us, you know, levity to make direct connections with events uh, happening in the headlines with any degree of real certainty. You look at some of these signs, there's going to be wars and famines, wars and rumors of wars. That's been the case since he said it. There's always wars and rumors of wars. And the reason is, is because of the human condition, not because of particular things in history. The third is, is just because we can't say with certainty, this is exactly how God is orchestrating the events of history. It is absolutely a must for Christians to maintain that God is orchestrating the events of history. Mm -hmm. You know, I was once forwarded an email from a dean of a Christian school who, who said, you know, as you're looking to teach like a Christian in your class, if you're a history teacher, talk about the providence of God and the defeat of the Spanish Armada, for example. And the person sending me this example was like, you know, can you believe this is, you know, so simplistic? And, and the answer was somewhere different because, you know, this particular dean was talking about, you know, the providence of God over British history. But the defeat of the Spanish Armada was the providence of God for both the British and the Spanish. Right. In other words, that's the way history is written forward. 
We talked on in our editorial call this week about a book from years ago from Stephen Carter, I think is the author's name. I could be wrong on that, but it's about God's judgments. He was trying to write a book in response to the way everyone reacted when Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson you know, blamed 9-11 on gays and lesbians. Mm-hmm. And I think later they did it with Katrina. And Robert, Pat Robertson came in the news again this week for coming, going on 700 Club and talking about, you know, the end times here with Russia and the Ukraine. And Carter's response was to say, look, the normative way of seeing calamity in the Bible is God's judgments. Now, saying this is God's judgment and this is why and how he's orchestrating it, that's too far. But to look at calamity as if it's not God's judgment is not a Christian view of history. And I think the same thing applies here. To look at what's happening as if it's not the unfolding of the eschaton. This is the normative way Christians have seen things throughout history. And the normative way the New Testament writers saw it was as indicators that God was orchestrating the ongoing flow of human history, which has a culminating point. Where we're at in that history or that culmination, we don't know. And it's, it's not a responsible thing to do to overstep that. So we, we ought not say, here's exactly what God's plan is. And we ought not say, God has no plan here because right. he does have a plan. It, we're supposed to be encouraged and, and emboldened by the fact that he has a plan, even if we don't know all the aspects of it. Totally. Sorry, that was a long theology lesson. No, I'm happy for it. That's what I was looking for. I mean, so in this Rolling Stone piece, one of the parts that stood out to me was right at the beginning. The writer says, to much of the world, current events may look like the unhinged machinations of a megalomaniacal authoritarian intent on worldwide disruption. But to Christians of a certain ilk, Pastor Lori argued that the war could be viewed as something else entirely, a sign of the second coming of Christ. And right there, I was like, now something else entirely. That's interesting because I I don't think those two things have to be mutually exclusive. That Putin is a a maniacal, would-be tyrant, and this is also within God's plan. And so then I became annoyed reading this piece with my journalist hat on, not even my theological hat on, because I was like, well, this is just bad writing. This is a person who is completely unfamiliar with the premise of God's sovereignty. Like he's writing about this argument, this end times argument in a way that nobody who holds up these arguments would recognize. And that's just bad writing. And that's, and and that's common. That's certain. That's that's super common. And that's the snarkiness, right? Totally. One of the things I shared when we were talking about this in our editorial meeting this week is I remember reading a book a couple of years ago. This was about parenting. And a woman had written an essay who she had found out she had terminal cancer when she had very young children. And she said something like, you know, I always wondered what life would be like if you knew you only had a certain amount of time to live. And she said, it turns out when you have young children, it's pretty much the same. You just make more pancakes. And she was just kind of talking about, you know, you have to go day to day. You still got to take care of your kids. You got to figure out what you're doing for lunch. You got to do all that kind of stuff. That to me, I I thought of it again this week in this conversation, because I think more or less that's the responsibility of Christians. Like you said, when, when Jesus gave us this wisdom about the end times, like telling us like, I will come back. You know, he he did give us some information. We're not meant to have no information about it. But that was meant to be comforting. And what we're meant to do in the meantime is to live faithful, peaceful lives. And I think he understood that that would feel hard and that times like this, when things feel really chaotic and sad, that that would be especially hard. But I go back to then again, too, the parable of the weeds, When he says, you know, the kingdom of God is like a man who plants a field and then in the middle of the night, the enemy comes and sows weeds in the field. And the next morning, his servants say, should we go and dig up the weeds? And he says, no, because you might hurt the seeds in the process. What you know from that is that there's going to be weeds in the field. Like there's going to be painful stuff that happens, but in God's sovereignty and wisdom, for some reason, that's how it has to go in order for enough, you know, flourishing to happen or enough kingdom building to happen before he comes back. And that's, that feels like the extent of what we need to know, because that's the extent of what he told us. So I share the concern because I've seen it as well with some pastors or people who claim to be pastors who make a lot of money talking about the end times, or they've recognized that people will spend a lot of money 
to buy, you know, the, the things that they're told to buy or to buy the pamphlets that'll tell you exactly when it's going to come. And again, there have been people over the decades who've predicted a specific date and then they're wrong. But And, and so I understand the, the instinct to poke fun, but I do think that it, it misunderstands the, the theology behind it. Like this isn't a topic that's completely ignored in scripture at all. Yeah, I, I think to understand the context, and that is the more that our culture gets uh, disconnected from a transcendent view of reality and gets more and more locked into being as uh, one sociologist, Charles Taylor put it disenchanted. In other words, seeing everything kind of in this physicalist, mechanistic sort of way, you know, unsuper, not, you know, not superintended by any higher power. The more that any sort of ruminations on this are going to sound absolutely batty. They're just going to sound crazy. I remember Russell Moore years ago being interviewed somewhere and they were talking about, do you really believe that a dead man rose again? He goes, oh, it's worse than that. You know, I believe he's coming back on a white horse to, gets weirder. You know, yeah. to take out the wicked. And it's going to get weirder. We're going to be seen as weirder. And there's some level we just got to be okay with that. And when we're seen as weirder, any mention of it out loud is going to see be seen as crazy. Paul told the church at Thessalonica, comfort one another with these words. So just because people think we're crazy is not the reason to A, talk about each other as if we're crazy, and B, uh, stop talking about the culmination of human history at all. That's also talked about throughout the New Testament as being kind of a source of hope. Awesome. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Breakpoint this week from the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. We're at a cultural inflection point. This is a point in history when marriage, parenting, and family structures are being redefined and reinvented. And the question that remains is, what about the kids? Do children have rights? And how are they being threatened when adult happiness is all that seems to matter? The Colson Center, along with Focus on the Family, is offering a crucial conversation for this cultural moment that's undergoing incredible change. Katie Faust and John Stone Street will discuss a myriad of ways that children are being forced to sacrifice for adults. The lifelong harm that this sacrifice inflicts on children is immense. And Katie and John will be discussing how the church can stand up for children in this moment. This is a free event. It's offered on March 15th at 5.45 Eastern time in Holland, Michigan. At 7 p.m. Eastern, we will begin a live stream of the conversation that Katie and John will have on the rights of children, how we can protect them in an age of redefining family. To register for this free event, visit colsoncenter.org forward slash events. Again, that's colsoncenter.org forward slash events. We're back on Breakpoint this week. John, I want to turn now from the end times in the Eastern European front to the end times in Florida. There was a bill that passed, officially passed the state Senate in Florida this week. Governor Ron DeSantis has indicated he plans to sign, but as of right now, he has not signed it yet. The media and activists are calling it the don't say gay bill, but this is a bill that prohibits discussions of gender identity and sexuality as part of the official curriculum in Florida schools for kindergartners through third grade. So it has nothing to do with whether you can say the word gay out loud in a classroom. This is about what's the official curriculum that is put into place in these classrooms. So the bill said that gender identity and sexuality should not be part of the curriculum until at least fourth grade. So this, as you can imagine, has caused a stir. When I first heard about it, I wasn't quite sure what to think about it because, you know, we've had conversations here before about free speech and how important it is, but also the fact that within a Christian worldview, free speech has to have its own limitations. And I was wrestling through what's accurate about the coverage of this bill and whether this bill is a good thing or not. One of the things I kept coming back to, and then I want to get your thoughts on this, both the the reaction to it and also the thing itself. But one of the things I was really thinking about this week is, you know, there was a time when I would have viewed, you know, potential legislation like this, or I would have thought you should view it in a vacuum. So, I would see a bill like this and say, is is this good? Like, do we need to hamper speech like this? Is this hampering speech? 
And I would just take it at face value and make the decision. But the reality is that's not the world that we're in. And sometimes legislation is needed because of the conditions on the ground. So this is similar to the accusation that the church often gets that we're obsessed with sexuality or we talk about homosexuality all the time when the reality is if we are talking about it, it's because the culture is too and it warrants a response because the people in our congregations are thinking about it or wrestling with it. You wouldn't think 20 years ago you needed a law that said you shouldn't be asking first graders what gender they feel like they are and then also not telling their parents about it. But the situation we're in now, I think it's hard to argue that point. We do need it. I mean, it's just the reality on the ground is unfortunately we need something like this at this point. That's sort of a new way of thinking about it for me, but I don't know how else to approach it. it you can't not react to what's happening on the ground, especially when it comes to children. So tell me what your thoughts are on this bill. Is this a good thing? And how have you sort of understood the reaction to it? Well, I, you know, tongue in cheek, you said it's the end of the world in Florida because that's the way this bill has been portrayed. And this is a very important point. Because tomorrow, Rolling Stone will have an article talking about some reason that there's an apocalypse imminent because of some act from a conservative. The HuffPost does this all the time. BuzzFeed does this all the time. That's true. They kind of peddle their own. They kind of peddle their own end time stuff. Oh, there's an apocalypse. Yeah, every worldview has an apocalypse. It don't, 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 you know, just like every worldview has a substitute theory of creation, a substitute theory of sin a substitute theory of salvation. They have a substitute theory of restoration. You remember the four chapters, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. To deny any of those chapters is to get reality wrong. But you pretty much go through those chapters. Even if restoration is, you know, some sort of dystopian future where everything falls apart. Uh, the Handmaid's Tale, you know, is certainly an apocalyptic piece of literature. And the fragility of the movement that is pushing back and accusing this particular bill of being something that it isn't is one of its features. It's not a bug, it's a feature. It becomes a feature when there's not real arguments to be made. There's no way this bill would have been thinkable 25 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And that's because of two things. Number one is that the ideas that this bill is trying to actually kind of hold in check has been kind of so aggressive that, you know, it, it, it's crazy. I, you know, there was a, an article written years ago from Michael Cromerty, who was formerly a VPPC, and he was talking about kind of this narrative of theocrats like Jerry Falwell trying to take over the world. And he goes, look, the real story is not that Jerry Falwell woke up one day and said, I'm going to take over politics. In fact, in 1960, whatever, he said, I don't want to have anything to do with politics because my job is to preach the gospel. Instead, he woke up somewhere in the 70s and realized that prayer had been banned from school, that pornography was on the front you know, of the counter at 7-Eleven. And abortion on demand had become legal. You, you know, in other words, there was this kind of encroaching aggressive secularism and basically looked up and goes, wait a minute, I'm being shot at. I need to do something in response. Now, you can argue about whether what he did was the right thing or, you know, to what degree or whatever. But he wasn't the aggressor in this. Florida Republican legislators aren't the aggressors in this. There's one class total that gets taught from kindergarten through 12th grade. And it ain't math, and it ain't reading, and it ain't history, and it ain't science. The only class that goes from kindergarten through 12th grade in most school districts and state-run schools is sex education. And that sex education now has become not just sexual mechanics or sexual parts, it's become sexual ideology and sexual identity. And it's not teaching both sides. It's teaching these things as if they're foregone conclusions. And as you brought up, and this is really important, pitting the student against the parent in this. So you have, on one hand, just kind of this all-out aggression of this ideology. And the second reason this bill is necessary is that the school has now reached a point. And of course, we heard it during some of the debates out of the Loudoun County School Board with CRT and, and then also, you know, some of these kind of Zoom school board meetings that we're now able to kind of get a glimpse into where educational officials and teachers are basically saying, and you have also progressive lawmakers now also saying, but that parents have no role in their kids' education. 
These are both brand new things, and they're very aggressive ideas that make a bill like this necessary. Get it? So, so in other words, th there's a fragility. These things are extreme positions. Extreme positions make the person who pushes those extreme positions fragile. Because when you get to an extreme position like this, you've outpaced any sort of rationale. There's no reason. There's no argument. And so anything that's a pushback, you play to be the victim. You pretend to be harmed. And that becomes your number one strategy. And that's what's happening here. The fragility is absolutely incredible. And you're seeing the fragility calling this the don't say gay bill. That's insane. All the students, for example, that walked out of uh, Winter Park High School. This bill doesn't apply to them. Yeah. They're in high school. This is like saying, hey, if you're under the age of eight, the thing you shouldn't be talking about without parents being present is sex. This isn't controversial in a sane world. Yeah. It's not controversial at all. So I, I think the other thing to point out is that what sex ed has become, you alluded to this a little bit too, because you said it, this isn't, it's not science either. This is certainly not science. This is not anatomy, which is funny because if it were the, if it were actual anatomy, which is probably the most beneficial part of sex ed, at least as we used to conceive of it, nobody would be saying like, we should teach that to first graders because they can't understand that yet. That's not what you learn in first grade. They're learning to read. They're not going to look at the human body and be able to recognize all the different bones and systems and whatever. I can't even do that. But anyway, there, there's an organization called the Sexuality Information and Education Council. And it, so SECUS is the acronym. This has been around for decades, I think since the 60s. They make school curriculum for public schools for sex ed. They've done this for years. I think it was either last year or the year before. They changed their brand. They changed their tagline to this. And if you go to their website right now, seekus.org, you'll see this. Seekus, sex ed for social change. They're not hiding this anymore. This is not sex ed to teach you about sex ed. This is sex ed for social change. In other words, John, this is a religion. OK, and what Florida has decided to do is say, we don't think that's appropriate for our kids of this age. They had to do it. They had to do it because it was happening. This isn't something out of the blue, like you said. This has nothing to do with whatever they're being accused of. I mean, it's silly to even talk about hatred or a feeling of ickiness about homosexuality. This is about not wanting this religion taught to kids that are this age. A, because it's unscientific and untrue, but B, because it's inappropriate for the age group at all, even if it were the scientific anatomy of whatever they're learning. Yeah, another sign, by the way, of the fragility here is that, that, you know, the accusation that Disney, who was actually campaigning apparently privately to lawmakers and to Ron DeSantis, uh, the governor of Florida's office, you know, they, he, they, they accused Disney of not being loud enough, which secured a $5 million donation from Disney. And, and so then you, it's when you start to realize this whole thing's a racket. It's a financial racket to raise a lot of money. It's so much theater, John. Disney has its own zip code. What are they going to do? <laughs> Pick up and move their entire town to another state? Yeah. I mean, how, how many different places do we want to brainwash our kids? How many different places do we think in order for real change, or what did you call it, sex education for social change? How many different places do we actually think this needs to be done? I mean, it is being done through Disney channels already. It is being done in both subtle and blatant ways. It is being done in every commercial now. The sheer amount of commercials that portray gender confusion or sexual disorder, you know, disorderedness far outpaces any sort of even the most, you know, generous population guesses and estimates. It, it, so so we, we, we need it at school as well. But I also don't want to commit the genetic fallacy. But since you brought up Secus, I mean, let's be really clear. Secus was founded by a woman named Mary Calderon. Mary Calderon was an educator who had embraced the ideology of Alfred Kinsey. Alfred Kinsey, of course, being the sex researcher who, based on his study of norms for prostitutes and prisoners, then applied it to the general population and, and, and started challenging laws, started challenging education, started challenging everything else. So he had the ideas, but he was a pretty icky guy. And culture changes not just with ideas, but also with champions of those ideas. One of uh, Alfred Kinsey's devout disciples was a guy named Hugh Hefner. 
artists and educators are extremely powerful in changing culture. Hugh Hefner was the artist of the sexual revolution. Mary Calderon was the educator. The artifacts that these champions put into the cultural imagination were pornography and sex education at all levels of public education. And by the way, the first big grant that went to CECAS came from Playboy magazine. So you just need to know some of that history to know kind of what we're talking about. But you're exactly right. This has never been about education. It's always actually been about social change. It's nice to, I guess, at some level that the branding matches the reality. But I think it's important. I mean, the call here for all of us as Christians is to know what this bill says. It doesn't say don't say gay. Good for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis when a reporter started asking him why the bill said things that it didn't say. He pushed back and said, it doesn't say that. And that needs to be clarified. We also need to make sure we understand this is a children's rights issue. Mm -hmm. If I were walking down the street or you were walking down the street with your daughter, I was walking down the street with Hunter and a man jumped out and exposed himself or I came across some public act of lewdness or obscenity or a public official or trusted adult in their life says, hey, just trust me. And then actually proceeds to do something horrific to them. We could put that person in jail. This is a predatory exposure to ideas that challenge their understanding of who they are and their sexual innocence by a trusted official in their life. Mm -hmm. And we can't do anything about it. That's what this bill is trying to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. John, let's take another quick break. We'll be right back with more Breakpoint this week from the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. In a world of nonstop headlines, many Christians are looking for the right way to seek God faithfully. We don't just want to read the news, we want to have an impact. What if the solution was as straightforward as simply praying together? To some, this feels way too easy. There's always a danger of talking about prayer, but never actually doing it. It's easy to post a quick thoughts and prayers on someone's Facebook wall when we don't know what else to say. When Christians do that, we let one of the most powerful practices of Christian discipline sink to the level of cliche. But with loneliness at historic levels, there's a widespread sense of purposelessness, a cynicism among young people. Many are deconstructing elements of their faith that they've previously taken for granted and are desperate to see the Christian life lived out well. They just don't know where to turn to. Likewise, older Christians are eager to pour into the next generation, but they feel like it's easy to get stuck. All of us are wrestling with the ways that religion has been privatized in our modern world, soiled off by generations or relegated to a superficial hello on Sunday mornings. But prayer speaks to each of these cultural flashpoints. It's so much more than simply just a way for us to connect with God privately. It's where we bear our hearts and turn to him in community. Oswald Chambers once wrote that prayer does not fit us for a greater work. Prayer is the greater work. And that's why at the Colson Center during the season of Lent, we are offering a time of guided prayer. We're calling it Pray With Me. It centers on Tony Souter's book, The Pray For Me Campaign, that seeks to bridge the generational gap with prayer. We invite you to these inspiring and encouraging times where friends of the Colson Center share some of the ways that prayer has impacted them and encourage us not only to engage our community, but to engage our community with prayer. John opens the time in a special prayer for us each week. And these friends of the Colson Center share their thoughts and also lead us in prayer. And all of that's bookended by a special time of music with our friend, Josh Bales. We want to invite you to sign up for these times of guided prayer. You can sign up and participate online, live, every Wednesday, or we will email you recordings of the time where you can watch at your leisure. To join us in this time of guided prayer, simply visit breakpoint.org forward slash pray for me. Again, that's breakpoint.org forward slash pray for me. Welcome back to Breakpoint This Week. I'm Maria Bear alongside John Stone Street. 
John, I want to talk about some of the commentaries we shared this week at Breakpoint.org and in the Breakpoint podcast. We were batting a thousand this week, but actually in our last conversation about this bill in Florida, I was thinking about this Breakpoint you did this week about trigger warnings. You know, trigger warnings are this new popular thing that you're supposed to do when, you know, you're about to read something or watch something on TV or read a piece on the internet or read a tweet that, you know, might have some subject material in it that could make you feel uncomfortable or afraid or trigger some uncomfortable memories or whatever it might be. You're supposed to put a trigger warning at the top and then you indicate, you know, the, this this includes graphic content or whatever it is. And this study actually found that trigger warnings in most cases tend to promote anxiety rather than decrease it. And I was thinking about this in our last segment because I think what this gets to is the power of suggestion. And that is one of my biggest concerns when it comes to sex ed being taught at younger and younger ages and with the sort of ideology that Sikas brings to the table, which is if you go to a first grader or kindergartner and you say something like, now, are you a boy or a girl? That is such a weighty thing to say to them that the suggestions behind that is that A, you might not know, B, you can decide. C, your body doesn't give you that answer. And D, I have a right to know and you need to tell me. And we should all be talking about it. Uh, there's, there's so much behind that. And kids at those ages are incredibly open to those suggestions. If I went to my five-year-old and said, would you like to fly to school today? She would think that that was an option because that's how kids respond to the world. And that's how kids learn about the world that they live in is from adults. And trigger warnings to me feel like they're sort of in that same camp where so, for example, I have found since becoming a mom, I can't read or watch anything, especially like fiction that has to do with children dying because I, I just have a really, really hard time with that. And I've had, I've had an anxiety attack before and I just try to avoid it. So a lot of times when people recommend books or whatever else to me, I always ask, you know, this is my one thing well, I avoid. Thank you so much for listening to Breakpoint. I understand it in like that cultural sense, but I do think that, 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 that a lot of times what's happened is in our overzealousness to add these trigger warnings is it's a suggestion. We're saying you're about to feel very nervous and anxious and triggered. And human experience teaches that like telling a person not to think about elephants, they're going to start thinking about elephants. They're going to start feeling nervous and triggered and anxious. And it's it's interesting that somebody took the time to study it and found that, yeah, that's pretty much the case. Yeah. As an introvert at parties, one of the things I like to do when it gets awkward, at least silent, is say, um, you know, whenever it's silent in a room for seven seconds, somebody's thinking about Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and of course, now for the rest of their lives, when it's silent after seven seconds, somebody will be him. thinking about Abraham Lincoln. You just like having that power over people. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I am just kidding. It, 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 we, we have to have enough common sense to know that there's such a thing as age appropriateness. There's such a thing as fragility. There's some things that we are calling harmful that aren't. And that doesn't mean that there aren't ideas that are harmful. And, and we should be big enough to know this. This, this, this shouldn't be controversial. There is a growing degree of fragility in a culture, and it's, in a sense, a reaction to not recognizing things that were harmful or overlooking them or telling people to get over it or whatever. It doesn't mean we should go ahead and scare everybody with our trigger warnings. I mean, in this list of that br the Brandeis stu students put together, it was just kind of crazy. So like the phrase, hey, man, you're killing it, which is usually a compliment. No, that's triggering. You can't do that. Or, you know, the, the, the idea of trigger warning itself made the list of Brandeis students' list of trigger warning words because they were like, it creates too much anxiety. If this were a Saturday Night Live skit, I'd be like, that's too much on the nose, guys. That's just too silly. You can't go that way. It's just too perfect. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. So, and, and, I, and I think that to, to say that, you know, first through third graders shouldn't be exposed to this challenging ideology. I mean, I, listen, I'll have a conversation with anyone on gender ideology and sexual orientation because it doesn't trigger me. Part of not being triggered, by the way, is being prepared. If you don't know the difference, for example, between an assertion and an argument, you don't know actually how to think about a particular topic, your belief on that topic becomes really vulnerable, right? When you run out of reasons, you start to yell. When you, when you run out of facts, you start to whine. We see that on so many of the 
ideas that we're not supposed to question and the very activity of questioning them because it sends somebody over the edge. The reason it sends them over the edge is because their position is weak. And we're talking about grownups. We're talking about something called education, which is actually supposed to be about this. This is, we're talking about completely different things when we're talking about Brandeis students and we're talking about second graders. Totally. Yeah. I want to talk to you about another commentary we shared this week. This was fascinating to me. And I, without even looking at the byline, I could tell you wrote this with our colleague, Glenn Sunshine, because he just is a wealth of knowledge about church history. But this was the response to, you know, attacks or allegations of Christian nationalism in the U.S., and that's just that's become such a buzzword that if if you're accused of Christian nationalism, it's almost akin to being accused of being a racist at this point. You guys really took a step back and were looking at what does it mean to uh, support nationalism and could that be biblical at all? And you started with that quote from Father Newhouse that you've shared before where he said, when I die, I expect to meet Jesus as an American. And what he meant, of course, was that I believe God put me in a certain place and time just like he put everybody else in the world in a certain place and time. And that's part of the calling he's put on me. And we have no reason to believe that that does not remain after we die because, and you guys brought up some of the literature in the scriptures when Jesus talks in Revelation and other places about his return and that people of every tribe and tongue and nation will come and worship God and will fall before the lamb, which implies that there will still be nations when that happens. So you guys were really looking at what does it mean to be a nation and I think the, the interesting question for me is, how do we respond to that? If we ever take any pride in that, if we ever spend any time thinking about it, is that unbiblical or wrong? One of the strange things I, I think about our culture asking this question right now is that we do that about all kinds of other things. You know, people are really proud of the culture that they come out of, which is understandable and good and something to be celebrated. People are proud of their racial identity, which can get problematic, but also I think generally is is healthy. People can be proud of their gender. They can be proud of their country. But for some for some reason, when it comes to the country, that's where it gets really controversial for people. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's 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 an easy scapegoat. And people are proud of their race or their culture if it's the right race or the right culture. And it's also a problem to kind of equate nation with race with culture. I mean, some nations are ethnically, you know, relatively homogenous. But there's a grand difference between nation and race and culture. So to say I'm an American isn't to say anything about race and isn't to say anything about culture. You know, what culture are you from? You know, the deep south, from the north, from the Midwest, from the coast? Are you from a religious background? Are you from a non religious I mean, you know, these things are just kind of strange. And what we have basically is a new set of good guys and a new set of bad guys that have been predetermined across the board. And again, this is why it's so important to go back and say, well, what does the Bible say about who's guilty and who's not? What does the Bible say about who's beyond hope and who's not? And the same thing applies here with nation. What does the Bible say about nations? To kind of act proud of a nation, particularly the American nation and that, or any, any sort of kind of European nation is to be beyond the pale. It's to be considered, it's, it's just a kind of a wrong thing to do. And many Christians kind of have, you know, gravitated towards this, kind of embracing this, this, this categorization. And it's not a biblical one. Nations are parts of God's providential oversight of history, to go back to our very first conversation today. This is Acts 17. Paul says that God determines the exact times and places in which we live. We walk through so many other scriptures, like where does the nations pop up? A lot of people think, well, it's God's judgment on Babel. No, nations actually pop up before that. And the Babel story, which did create even more nations, at least along the, along the line of, of languages, wasn't a judgment. It was, a, it was an act of mercy where God was like, you know what? We can't have them all in one place or they'll think up things they ought not do and they'll figure out how to do them. So let's prevent them from their own sin nature. Let's protect them at some degree from their own sin nature, at least collectively, and send them away. Now, with languages of science and computer technology, those language barriers are being crossed again. And we're seeing the potential of the human capacity to do unbelievable things that we ought not do, but you know we have this drive to do it. So that's where the Babel story comes in. But before we embrace kind of the culture's moral indignation, we ought to go back and say, well, what does the Bible actually say 
about nations. The other thing that I think is absolutely necessary, absolutely necessary in this is St. Augustine's view of loves, which is, which is that God created us fundamentally as lovers. To love is not the problem, but it is very possible for our loves to become disordered. And it, it, they become disordered primarily when I put love of something above love of God, or I equate love of something, the created, with love of God, the creator. By the way, this is Romans 1. That confusion between creator creation is, is right there in Romans chapter 1. Augustine talked about loving it. So yeah, uh, love of my spouse can become disordered and can become idolatrous. Love of nation can become disordered and can become idolatrous. That doesn't mean that the love of nation is wrong or the love of my spouse is wrong. It just means that it has a God-given order. Uh, you know, Christians are just quick to jump on the self-flagellating you know, bandwagon, you know, how bad we all are. And I, I think we just need to be more careful. And this is an example, by the way, the only way to make sense of the chaos of the moment is to go back to the story. So let's go back to what the story says about nation. And that's what that commentary did. Mm, that's cool. I think one of the things that gets missed just real quickly too in this conversation is a lot of times the allegation that churches or Christians are engaging in Christian nationalism is based on the fact that we see some Christians advocating for, let's say, legislation or other public policy that reflects a biblical worldview. And we feel like that is, you know, an attempt at theocracy or something that violates the spirit of democracy or pluralism or whatever it is. And we equate that with something called Christian nationalism and we don't like it. But I think if you dig into that a little bit and you really sit with it philosophically, you have to leave space for what we were just talking about, for example, with the curriculum in Florida, talking about sexuality with young kids. If you believe the Christian story is true and that the Bible is an accurate view of reality and an accurate account of human history and human nature, then you're going to believe that public policy or the, the rules by which we govern ourselves the closer that they align with reality, the better they're going to be for all people, whether people believe in that story or not. So I'm not saying that I want to protect Christian kids in Florida in public school from hearing about sexuality because Christians think that sexuality is reserved for marriage and et cetera. I think every kid deserves to be treated safely with regards to sexuality. And every kid, no matter their religious background or whether they grow up to be followers of Jesus or not, deserves not to have that taught to them too early. And they deserve not to be guided in a disordered direction because that will hurt them and that will hurt their families regardless of what they believe. So if people are advocating for public policy or something that looks Christian outside of the four walls of a church, we get nervous from a, a pluralism standpoint. But we're not wrestling with the fact that we truly believe that this way of living, you know, according to certain tenets. Now, there will be limits, of course. I don't think we'd ever support any sort of public policy that forces worship of Jesus or anything like that. But we're talking about things that we think are best for people no matter what, or we're talking about things that we think people deserve to be protected from no matter what. For example, children's rights is a great example. We've talked about several situations where the church might be the only institution left that's willing to talk about children's rights when it comes to things like assisted reproduction or gay marriage or whatever else it is that affects children and the rest of our culture is not willing to talk about it. The church is talking about it. You can't equate that with Christian nationalism in a negative sense. You have to understand that we believe the effects of sin are real for everybody. We believe the effects of living according to the Bible are real for everybody, regardless of what you believe about it. And that's part of what motivates it. It's not some sort of, I just want everybody to live like I do, and I want to hear you know, prayers from everybody around me at dinner time. It's not that sort of thing, but that's often how it's painted. Right. And, but we have some guilt in this, right? And, and in other words, just because there's not something per se wrong with Christians being quote unquote nationalist, and I, you know, obviously that word's in quotes and has to be defined, or let's just say patriotic, because right now to be patriotic is to be accused of, of nationalism. But sometimes the way we go about our civic engagement needs to be corrected. In other words, just because we have right intentions doesn't actually mean that we're doing things right. Just because we're trying to stop the bad guys doesn't justify using excessive force. That's the just war doctrine. I, you know, I, I get emails like this all the time. How, how dare you criticize this politician or that leader or this politician or whatever? 
He has the right intentions and right intentions aren't good enough. You know, they're, they're just not, they're not good enough for me and they're not good enough for anybody else. So there's three things we have to realize that we sometimes forget in our attempts to be good citizens or to, you know, influence society. Number one, we need to understand the limits of policy. When all you have is the state, you believe that the state should then, you know, orchestrate life according to the way you want it. That's not what we believe. Not only do we believe that the state ought not orchestrate life the way we, we want it, but we believe the state can't and there's all kinds of other factors. So we shouldn't think that we can hit a home run with a particular election or even a particular bill. So this Florida bill, for example, is, is I think a good protective bill. It doesn't do what the critics say, but it doesn't solve a problem. Sure. Right? It, it doesn't actually fix what we're trying to do. And we have, we have to have wisdom about the limits of policy. Secondly, we need to be careful on how we talk about what we're trying to do. So for example, you know, public talk about this elected leader, equating them with a biblical character, I think is inappropriate. First of all, it's a bad use of scripture. Second, you're talking to a group of people who don't believe any of this stuff. Right. And this is what Chuck Colson called prudential language. Now, I, I believe that the Bible itself has power and we can use biblical language. And many politicians have figured out how to do that in both good and bad ways. What I am saying is, is that if Christianity is true and a Christian moral claim is an adequate view of reality itself, we can argue from the Bible. We can also argue from reality. We can Natural do both. Law. And totally. we need to be able to do both. Mm -hmm. We need to be ambidextrous. Let's put it that way. And I think also the thing that always has to be prioritized, particularly in cases where we're trying to reverse cultural bads and replace them with cultural goods is that Christianity is always most convincing and at its best when we do victim care. There are victims of our bad ideas. Let's take immigration. To say that nations should have borders should not be controversial. It's not nationalistic or racist. Some of the ways we say that our nation should have borders has been nationalistic and racist. We should be able to tell the difference. Totally. And because we've said our nation shouldn't have borders or act like it under this particular administration, there's a whole lot of victims flooding in through the southern border. How can Christians care for those victims? I think the same thing is true for the victims of the sexual revolution. I think the same thing is true for the victims of uh, condescending charity. I think the same thing is true for, and you know, just list it out. So in, in other words, we need to know the limits of our policy. We need to talk about why we're advancing a particular position in all kinds of ways. And we need to also accompany whatever thing we're trying to do with care for the victims of, of, of the policies we're trying to either overturn or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Let's wrap it up there, John. Let's move to our time of recommendations. I wanted to ask you first, did your friend Shashevoloskinski, did he win his game last week? <laughs> You're, first of all, I know your husband told you to ask me that question. Actually, can I be honest with you? I know that he lost his game. I just wanted to ask you because I wanted to impress you that I was still thinking about it. Is that what it is? I, <laughs> no, I, I think your husband's probably an Ohio State fan. No, he doesn't really care about college basketball. Yeah, it was, it was brutal. I actually, uh, I was concerned going in. I thought that it's just a tough environment. They had Spanked North Carolina at North Carolina by over, by like twenty points. Was up. By, we're up by thirty. You know, uh, just not that long ago, North Carolina has been bad for the beginning of the year, and now have gotten a lot of things together. And they've got a couple of players in particular that are just outperforming right now and doing really well. The emotion of this, the the kind of the the craziness of this, you know, was just was too much. So I actually warned my daughter, who is a uh, a Duke fan by proxy as a, somebody who really likes basketball and loves me. And uh, I said, this could be bad. And it was. So I, I, I was concerned about it. And actually, I'm just checking. I think maybe, hold on a second. Did North Carolina lose yesterday in the tournament? Well, the ACC tournament's going on. Duke beat Syracuse, but uh, I didn't see what the score was Gosh, yesterday. Just so they, were, deeply, they were in trouble at one deeply point. Deeply don't care. You <laughs> oh, no, they, they pounded Virginia. That's actually pretty good. So I think there could be another confrontation here. Another and chance. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Okay, very good. Are you impressed that I remembered to ask you? Uh, no, no. Yeah, so yeah, impressed. Okay, very good. You. I know. I'm, su I'm such a cool girl because I know about sports. So my recommendation this week, which I I've, feel very confident you cannot possibly object to this. 
is, are you familiar at all with Brooke Frazier? She's a musician, a singer. She is with Hillsong Worship, but she also has her own, she releases her own albums as well. But she, are you familiar with her at all? I'm, I probably would recognize a song or so. But if this, if the song was, at our church, if the song was written, you know, after the 17th century, it's, it's, uh, it's suspect. Oh, okay. <laughs> she, so you know. she has my favorite voice, like of all time, just an unbelievable voice. And she released a new album last week that's called Seven. And it's just a live album of worship songs that she wrote. So I just can't recommend it enough because, and I'll recommend what the hey, all of her discography, all of her music, because her voice is unbelievable. She writes really great, beautiful, thoughtful lyrics, and it's just gorgeous. So that's my recommendation. Now, object to that. Tell me what you find objectionable about me recommending a worship album, Stone Street. Oh, because it dates after the 17th century. So <laughs> that, 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 that's what it is. It dates after the 17th oh, century. Oh, brother. Time. Now, I actually have two recommendations. If you are into college basketball, and I know we actually have uh, listeners that are, in preparation for the tournament, there is a great series on the ACC network called The History of the Tournament. It's all about the history of the ACC tournament. And I've been binging through that late at night, and it is fascinating. So well done. And uh, so anyway, if you haven't seen that, it's like a 30 for 30. John, do you remember when Kevin Ware was a player for Kentucky. Do you remember when he broke his leg? I do. I was against, uh, that was, uh, yeah, that was awful. That was when I took an interest. I, okay, so sometimes certain things traumatize me. That, that would have needed a trigger warning for me. I felt, I was so traumatized by both seeing that and just thinking of Kevin Ware that I like wrote him a letter after that. There's some things I just can't deal with. So that was probably my heaviest involvement in college basketball is when Kevin Ware broke his leg, but he's okay now. I still follow up with him sometimes and make sure he's good. This is another example. I mean, I, it, that was an interesting, another interesting antidote, but that was just another example of here we're all talking about basketball and you bring up just some random thing. No, it has to do with college basketball. That was I'm talking about, first relevant. of all, Kentucky's not in the ACC. Secondly, that didn't happen in the ACC tournament because Kentucky's not in the ACC, although it did happen, I think, against Duke. When you say ACC, all I think of is Arizona Christian College, which is now Arizona Christian University. So that's how little I know about these things. I, but that's one thing I know about college basketball. That was an appropriate time to bring that up. Uh, hey, can I also recommend, just as we close out, that Tuesday, I am going to be having a great conversation with Katie Faust in our Lighthouse Voices speaker series uh, that the Colson Center is doing in partnership with Focus on the Family at the Family Central Bookstore in Holland, Michigan. So if you're in the neighborhood, come visit us live. It'll be Tuesday night at 7 p.m. If you're not, you can sign up for the live stream by going to colsoncenter.org slash events. Actually, you can sign up to come in person or to be at the live stream there, colsoncenter.org slash events. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about children's rights versus adult happiness, which was a theme that came up a lot today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's going to be a cool event. Well, John, that's going to do it for the show today. Thank you so much for listening to Breakpoint this week from the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. I'm Maria Baer alongside John Stone Street. As always, we are going to continue our conversation and add more content over at the Breakpoint podcast. So you can find that wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find links to all the stories that we're talking about today, as well as other commentaries and resources at breakpoint.org. Thanks so much for being with us. God bless. Have a great week.